This is Tom McCarthy. Now that summer's here, you may be going to see some hot fuel problems. To make sure you're ready for them, we're going to turn now to Expert Tech for some expert advice on hot fuel handling. In this seminar, we'll be talking about why hot fuel handling has become an increasingly difficult problem and the major part that fuel itself plays in it. Another contributing factor is the body style of some vehicles, including trucks, with compact engine compartments which tend to reduce airflow and increase underhood temperatures. But before we really get started, I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of Expertech's new informational portable video seminars. When we finish, you should be able to recognize the symptoms of a hot fuel problem, some alternative solutions, and examples of what has been done to provide solutions. The first thing I'd like to discuss is fuel volatility. Volatility is the ability of fuel to evaporate, and it's measured in either of two ways. One is using the distillation curve method, and the other is by reed vapor pressure, or RVP. These distillation curves represent the amount of fuel evaporated at various temperatures. There's a regular test procedure to do that, and it gives us an idea of the difference between fuels. Clear indoline is a type of fuel that used to be considered summer grade fuel. It's used for emission testing and it has a vapor pressure of nine pounds. As we go up the scale in the range where we see peak underhood soak temperatures, you'll notice that about 40% of the volume is evaporated. In other words, in an open carburetor bowl at that temperature, 40% of the fuel would be evaporated and turned into vapor. Now let's look at a winter grade fuel at the same temperature. The graph shows that about 60% of the fuel would be evaporated and turned into vapor. That's a 20% increase in vapor compared to the summer grade fuel. For comparison, here's a curve of gasohol, 10% ethanol added to a nine pound base fuel. And we see we've picked up a couple of pounds of vapor pressure. Now compare the gasohol distillation curve with the gasoline curve at the same temperature. And you'll see that gasohol will indeed produce more vapor than gasoline. It compounds the problems we already have. The second method of identifying fuel volatility, and this is the most common one used in the engineering community, is reed vapor pressure, or RVP. And here's how it's measured. This is called a bomb. The relationship of the volume of these two chambers is four to one. We fill this lower chamber with gasoline that's already been chilled to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This upper chamber just has ambient air in it. Then screw the small chamber to the top one and immerse the bomb in a water bath at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll leave it there until the gasoline is vaporized and the pressure is stabilized. The resulting pressure that's read on the gauge is referred to as reed vapor pressure. Obviously, the higher the volatility of the fuel, the higher the vapor pressure is going to be. You can see that it's a relatively quick and accurate way to measure volatility. This method is used at the GM Desert Proving Grounds and all of the hot fuel tests run there have the reed vapor pressure, or RVP, read just before the fuel is put in the car and also at the conclusion of the test so that we have an accurate indication of the fuel we were using. Then we can tie vehicle performance to the RVP. You may wonder why have a concern about volatility, fuel vapor, and associated problems? Why not just make it all low RVP and get rid of the problems? That seems like the simple solution, but a low RVP fuel won't work because vehicles operate on a tremendously wide variation of temperatures between summer and winter. And for winter operation, it's desirable to have high volatility or high RVP fuel. Liquid gasoline doesn't burn. If you could get a lighted match past the vapors into liquid gasoline, it would go out. It's got to be atomized or vaporized with air before it will burn. 
For winter, we need to have fuel that will vaporize to some extent at very low temperatures. And so we need a high RVP winter fuel to aid in starting. So some of the fuel gets into the combustion chamber in a combustible form. There are some fuels that will start to put vapor into the air at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Conversely, in the summer, we don't want that for the very problems we're currently facing. We would like to have a lower RVP in the summer than in the winter. We don't have the problems of getting the vehicle started at the higher temperatures. Fuel volatility is something that's controlled to some degree. Part of that's done during fuel production when the cracking process takes place. And without going into any of the details of that process, I just want to mention that part of the cracking process gets rid of some of the undesirables in the fuel, like the light ends, those parts that would add an undesirable amount of vapor pressure or volatility to the fuel. The second part of the fuel production process is the addition of things such as octane improvers, detergents, and antioxidants to prevent ferrous parts from corroding. One of the octane improvers used for many years was lead. Legislation and the introduction of the catalytic converter made it impossible for us to use leaded fuel. And so as a result, the least expensive way of getting octane improvement has been implemented. The fuel companies obviously want to produce their fuel in the least expensive way. And so inexpensive octane improvers, propane and butane, products of the normal cracking process are used. But propane and butane are also very light and vaporize quickly. So along with an increase in octane, there's an increase in volatility. It's economically motivated because when you use the existing elements that are already in the crude, you get more gallons of fuel per barrel of crude. In addition, you don't have to add the expensive additives such as anti-detonants or octane improvers. Over the past 30 or 40 years, we've seen an ongoing increase in the volatility or RVP of the fuels. This graph from GM Fuels and Lube Research at the Milford Proving Grounds illustrates this increase. On the left side is the average RVP of summer grade leaded gasoline. Going back to 1940, seven pounds was considered summer grade fuel, which was great for lower vapor pressure. But notice the consistent upward trend to the present average of about 10 and a half pounds. That's 50% higher. Let me relate that to something. Until the last couple of years, the bogey at the GM Desert Proving Grounds for acceptable hot fuel handling was 10 pound RVB fuel at 100 degrees Fahrenheit air temperature. The vehicle had to perform acceptably under those conditions. That was because up until the mid 70s, that was about as high as you saw on summer grade fuel. But that's not true today. 10 and a half pounds is the national average and if the average is 10 and a half, there are lots of fuel that's higher. Chevrolet division has recently changed their standard for testing and has raised it to 11 pounds at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The job is tougher when you get that kind of vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure is the result of economic pressures for lower cost fuel. That's made possible by using butane and propane as octane improvers and the body designs that add heat to the engine compartment compound the high RVP problem. Let's take a look at how heat affects gasoline. Gasoline has no control over where the heat comes from. If it's present, it's going to turn some portion of the fuel into vapor or into bubbles. For example, look at the exhaust pipe routing on the F-car. The pipes wrap around the tank, and the fuel temperature is raised before it gets to the engine compartment. In the engine compartment, there are a number of things that contribute heat. The exhaust manifolds are one source, and an AIR system, if it's operating while the engine is warm, will further increase the exhaust manifold temperature. The radiator is put on the car as a cooling device, but basically it's a heat exchanger, which takes heat out of the coolant puts it into the air, and then the fan pumps that heated air right back through the engine compartment. Of course, there are hot spots, and perhaps they're more important to fuel line routing than to overall engine heat. If fuel lines are positioned near or against these hot spots, 
more vapor will be created than you already have. A uh, second factor that creates bubbles or vapor in the fuel system is pressure change. Whenever there's a change to a lower pressure, gasoline will make bubbles. Some of it will turn into vapor, expand and cause bubbles to form in the line. The conventional fuel pump creates a vacuum on the fuel line to pull the fuel from the tank. The result is a pressure drop. If you've ever watched fuel pulled through a transparent line, and we see this at the GM Desert Proving Grounds when we pull fuel out of a tank, it turns into bubbles. That whole line may be frothy just because it's under a low pressure. And that's why one of the things that's been released for the F car is an in-tank pump to help reduce vapor lock. It pressurizes that line and builds it up to about 3 PSI between the tank and the diaphragm fuel pump on the engine. This makes a dramatic reduction in the amount of bubbles in the system. A third factor that causes bubbles in the system is any orifice that fuel has to flow through. Anytime you restrict the area through which the fuel flows, particularly a sudden restriction, the fuel speeds up going through the orifice and then expands on the outlet side and you've immediately got bubbles. The fuel pump valves can cause bubbles in the fuel. You may have solid fuel flowing up to the pump, but bubbles can be formed simply by going through the orifice of the valve in the pump. Even the restriction across the filter in the carburetor will produce bubbles. The carburetor needle and seat, the main metering jet in the carburetor, and I'm going to talk about that in detail in just a moment, and sharp corners all cause bubbles. If you bend a clear plastic line through which fuel is flowing, enough to put an edge in it, bubbles will be formed. So sharp corners in the fuel line, sharp corners inside the carburetor, such as on the needle and seat, or sharp corners where two fuel passages intersect will cause bubbles. So the bubbles are there. We try to minimize them, but they are there, so we have to learn how to handle them and try to live with them. This creates two basic problems. In the case of vapor lock, it actually prohibits fuel from flowing altogether. Well, vapor lock really occurs in the fuel pump, but a contributor to that is the needle and seat orifice. Let's see if I can explain how that happens. If the needle and seat orifice is large so that fuel with a lot of bubbles in it can pass through easily, there's less pressure back down to the pump and less opportunity for vapor lock to occur. Conversely, if the needle and seat orifice is real small, you maintain a head of pressure in there, and as the fuel can't flow, the pressure builds up and you get a vapor lock right there in the fuel pump. This prevents the diaphragm from moving, so no fuel moves at all. The obvious question is, why not open up the needle and seat orifice and we'll get rid of all that? We'd like to do that, but we have to maintain a balance between vapor lock and spewing. I'll talk about that in just a moment. If the vapor or bubbles don't give you a complete vapor lock condition, at least they'll reduce the fuel flow, either in the filter or the needle and seat orifice, in the main metering jet orifice, or in the extension of the main metering jet down into the main fuel passage. Let's look at this cross section of a carburetor. We see a metering rod, main metering jet, then a passage from the main metering jet up through here to the main nozzle and also to the idle circuit. Let's concentrate on the circled main metering jet area. The fuel has to come in through these side orifices, through the metering orifice where the metering rod is, into the cavity below the main metering jet, then up to the nozzle and idle tube. As the fuel passes through any of those orifices or around those corners, bubbles are formed. In order to get rid of some of this bubble formation, there's been a complete redesign of the main metering jet. I want to show that to you here. What you're looking at in the main metering jet is a change in the cross hole diameter from 140 thousandths to 188 thousandths. You'll notice a milled section across these holes and compared to the present main metering jet, the threaded section is about 50 thousandths of an inch shorter. We'll discuss how this helps in just a few minutes. While your primary interest may be in resolving the problem, we believe this background information will aid your understanding the problem. But how can the problem be reduced or solved? First of all, there are a couple of factors we do not have control over, 
and we have to live with them. The first, obviously, is the weather. And the second is the fact that GM does not control fuel volatility. Our GM fuels and lube research exercises some influence on the petroleum industry, so our efforts are only partially successful. But there are a number of factors which we do have control over by virtue of design. First of all is vehicle temperature. And we've already talked about exhaust pipe routing. Fuel line routing is important, and this is something you can run up against in the field, especially if the vehicle has had any kind of work done to it, like body work or an engine change, that has resulted in a fuel line being routed near or against a hot spot. This includes the exhaust manifold, the block where it shouldn't be, or against a radiator or heater hose. Any of these conditions are going to add heat and cause vapor or bubbles. Perhaps you've seen in the field where someone insulated the fuel line to try to keep it cooler. Usually it does just the opposite, retains heat, and it can compound the problem. Engine compartment airflow has been reduced in the interest of aesthetics and the saleability of sporty line vehicles. As a result, we have some terribly high underhood temperatures, and F cars aren't the only one. The problem also exists in some trucks. Most of you are aware that an auxiliary blower fan kit has been released for the F car, and it's going to be used on some others. This is a blower that was originally used on a rear window defogger, and it's mounted on the right front fender with an inch and a half diameter hose from it to the float bowl, so that fresh, cooler outside air is blown against the carburetor float bowl. The blower fan turns on after the engine is shut down, to counteract the rising temperature during a hot soak condition. Another controllable factor is insulation. And I'm referring to the carburetor to manifold gasket. I would encourage you not to change that unless you have a service bulletin advising you to do so. Sometimes it looks like another gasket would be a better alternative. One aftermarket company put out a kit that contains a thicker carburetor to manifold gasket. Some people were reporting a degree of success with it, and we have no argument with the fact that if you isolate the carburetor from the manifold, it will help. However, that gasket was so soft that if you didn't torque the hold down bolts evenly, you could break the ear off the backside of the carburetor. That gets to be expensive, so we recommend that you don't use non-OEM gaskets. A second controllable factor is fuel handling. Putting the pump in the tank raises the line pressure, and whenever you can raise the pressure, you reduce vapor. Just a side note on that, when pressure is reduced, vapor is increased, and pressure is reduced when you go to a higher altitude. So as you go up in altitude, you'll develop more vapor with the same RVP fuel. The Denver fuel isn't as much different from sea level RVP as we'd like. It's one of the reasons there's been a rash of F-car problems in Denver. It's one of the first places we heard about it, and we believe the combination of RVP and altitude is the cause. We've already talked about line bends, about needle and seat size, and main metering jet redesign, as we described previously. This main metering jet design change provides a less abrupt change of direction and less pressure drop, thus reducing the bubble formation. The reduction in the length of the threaded portion was to ensure that none of the main metering jet extended into the main fuel passage. This had been another source of bubble formation. These design changes were developed by Carl Wellencotter of CPC Engineering, and as you know, they're very effective. On some vehicles, just the main metering jet change will solve the problem, while some other vehicles require both the main metering jet change and the blower installation. If you have hot fuel handling problems, check to be sure you don't have a fuel line routed near or against a hot spot, the wrong carburetor gasket, a stuck coolant thermostat, a fuel line kinked, wrong spark plugs, anything out of adjustment in the ignition system or evaporative control system. Any of these conditions will aggravate a hot fuel handling problem. It's a system and it has to function together. There are several things that have been done to improve vapor handling. One such item is a vapor return line from the fuel pump to the tank. The orifice size in the pump is critical to acceptable vapor handling. 
The intent is to vent vapors back to the tank to avoid vapor lock. It also allows us to use a smaller needle and seat in the carburetor because hopefully you're not pumping as much vapor up to the carburetor and it gives us better control of the liquid level with the float. Carburetor float bowl venting and baffling are also critical elements in acceptable hot fuel handling. These include the shape and sizes of vents that are cast in the air horn. These vents must work in conjunction with baffles, needle and seat, and air cleaner design for good drivability. I heard recently that we had end of line spewing on some F cars. That's not a super hot environment. It turned out to be two things. First, we got a sample of the fuel, which should have been nine or 10 pound fuel. There had been complaints of hard starts in the marshalling yards, so they doctored up the fuel. It checked out at 18 pounds RVP. Now the highest winter fuel we normally see is about 14 pounds. The second thing was a secondary baffle that's mounted at the rear choke wall. It had been subject to bending during handling, so it was redesigned with two tabs that slip over the choke wall to prevent bending. At the same time, the contour of the top was changed from a dished shape to flat. This altered the airflow pattern over the vents and contributed significantly to spewing. Just that simple change corrected spewing under normal conditions, not with 18 pound fuel. The air cleaner design, baffles, snorkel size, and snorkel angle are all critical to spewing. Remember a few years ago when it was popular to invert the top of the air cleaner because it gave you a lot more power, especially in Mark engines? We never documented the power increase. It sure sounded more powerful when the secondaries were opened but I can guarantee you spewing on a warm day, even without a soak, when the air cleaner top is inverted. I had it happen to me right on the road. I opened the secondaries and the car virtually fell on the front bumper because it was so rich from spewing. Spewing is a phenomenon that occurs when relatively cool fuel hits a very hot float bowl and turns to foam. And two things happen. First, it looks for a place to get out. It's expanded, there's vapor pressure, and it goes anywhere it can find a hole. The nozzle, front vents, rear vents, around the secondary metering rod. And since it's all foam, there's nothing to lift the float to control the inlet. So in rushes this relatively cool fuel at full fuel pump pressure, generating more vapor. This condition continues until the fresh fuel cools the float bowl and normal operation is restored. This whole scene may take only a few seconds, but when you've just called for power, it seems like a lifetime. And severe spewing can actually cause a vehicle to stall. The drivability symptoms of spewing and vapor lock are very similar and are often confused. They both cause power loss, usually a deep, prolonged sag. And to tell the difference is not easy. But here's one thing that will tell you for sure. If you can see black smoke from the tailpipe, it's definitely spewing and not vapor lock. Moderate spewing will be burned up in the catalytic converter, but heavy spewing can produce black smoke, and it's just the opposite of vapor lock. So make sure the air cleaner hasn't been fooled around with, particularly on older models. Make sure that the snorkel is headed in the right direction, that the needle and seat are the right size. We're always compromising on needle and seat size, because we'd like to have it small for spewing, but large for vapor handling to prevent vapor lock. As if we didn't have enough trouble with the things we can't control, and I suppose you could call this an uncontrollable element, emission regulations have an ongoing impact. The EVAP standard is two grams of hydrocarbon per vehicle per test. There are two parts to the EVAP test. First, the vehicle tank has a prescribed percentage of its capacity filled with test fuel, soaked at a specified temperature for a predetermined amount of time. Then the vehicle is put into a sealed shed, no leaks permitted, and an electric heating blanket is put under the fuel tank. The tank temperature is raised to a specified level, and after it's been in the shed for a specified time, a sampling device measures the amount of hydrocarbons in the air in the shed. Then the vehicle is removed from the shed, run through the full 23 cycle emission test, 
put back in the shed for another prescribed time period, and again, the hydrocarbons in the air are measured. This time, the vehicle's warm from the emission test. So if there's any breakthrough in the canister, any leakage from the air cleaner, or even past the throttle shaft, or the tank filler neck, it all goes into the air and gets measured. Only two grams of hydrocarbons are allowed for both tests combined. As a result, we've had to do a lot of sealing. Canister design is critical, and in many air cleaners, there's a charcoal element to trap vapors from the carburetor bowl vents. This all works very well and traps vapor from the tank, the carburetor bowl, and the carburetor vents. But once the vapors are trapped, something has to be done with them. You can't just leave them there. There's not enough capacity. And the law says you can't put them into the atmosphere. From a drivability standpoint, we'd like to do just that. But we've got to burn them first. So there's a line from the canister to the carburetor to provide a purge for the canister. Obviously, if you purge at the wrong time or the wrong amount, a drivability problem may result. So we try to control that purge one of three different ways, or a combination of some of these. There are ports in the throttle body located above the idle position of the throttle valves to prevent purge at idle or low flow rates. As the throttle is opened and airflow increases, the ports are subjected to vacuum and the purging process begins. The vapors are pulled into the engine and burned. We also use vacuum-controlled canister control valves and ECM-controlled electronic purge control. If we purge at too low an air rate through the carburetor, two conditions may result. First, during open loop operation, purging adds fuel, so a richer condition results. If the vehicle is in closed loop operation, a couple of different things occur. Originally, we thought that the closed loop feature would simply compensate and maintain stoichiometry. It does do that, driving the system lean to compensate by affecting a smaller jet to rod clearance. But this reduced area orifice causes more bubbles to form, and it's one explanation for the poorer hot drivability of a closed loop vehicle versus an open loop vehicle. We've talked about the fact that we have a fuel problem with increasing volatility that's compounded by the uncontrollable atmospheric conditions, and so we're saddled with the problem that we have to deal with. To deal with it in the F car, we've done three things to try to handle vapor lock and bubbles in the fuel system. There's been an in-tank fuel pump added to pressurize the line between the tank and the conventional fuel pump. There's been a fender-mounted blower fan to direct cooler air to the carburetor to cool it down, and the main metering jet has been redesigned to prevent formation of bubbles. Remember, bubbles and vapor form as a result of heat, pressure changes, and the RVP of the fuel. So if you have a hot fuel handling problem, check to be sure you don't have a fuel line routed near or against a hot spot, the wrong carburetor gasket, a stuck coolant thermostat, a fuel line kinked, wrong spark plugs, anything out of adjustment on the ignition system or evaporative control system. Any of these conditions will aggravate a hot fuel handling problem. Earlier, we talked about the increase in fuel volatility and the major role it plays in hot fuel problems. If you were to get fuel samples from several different brand gas stations in your area, and run vapor pressure tests, you might be surprised at the results. Of course, your customer can't go around testing gasoline, but ask the customer if he or she has been patronizing the same service station. If the answer is yes, then simply suggest that sometimes changing to another service station may help. That about wraps up our seminar on hot fuel handling. Remember the specific items we've discussed that can help you deal with this condition and the principle that keeping it cool really does help.
We've all heard the expression that the body runs like a finely tuned engine, but the opposite can also be true. When your car's engine is operating properly, it can run like a finely tuned body. And just as this jogger depends upon constant feedback from his senses for a smooth performance, a car's engine relies upon the constant feedback from a network of sensors for its smooth performance. One of the sensors most critical to an engine's performance is the oxygen, or O2, sensor. Why? Because a car engine's performance also depends in large part upon how well it breathes. In fact, breathing for both these engines means essentially the same thing, taking in just the right amount of oxygen to burn off the available fuel, now, whether that fuel is in the form of calories or gasoline. Well, too much of either can have unfortunate effects on both. But the few minutes we're going to spend investigating O2 sensor and sensor circuit problems will be a few minutes well spent if it can help reduce the number of comebacks due to repeat sensor circuit problems. In the process, we'll not only promote increased customer satisfaction, but we'll save ourselves a lot of time in diagnosing and resolving sensor circuit complaints. So you might say that the oxygen sensor is critical to the health of the engine. Its job is to continually monitor air-fuel mixture and to alert the engine's command center, the ECM, or electronic control module, when operating conditions require that the ratio of the mixture be changed. To complete the chain of command, the ECM, in turn, weighs the sensor's input, then tells the fuel system to either increase or decrease the amount of fuel being delivered to the engine. For a number of reasons, the simplest way for the O2 sensor to perform its monitoring task is to go about it indirectly. That is, the O2 sensor is placed in the exhaust manifold, and in effect, it reads the oxygen content of the exhaust gases, the byproducts of combustion, in order to determine whether the right mix of air and fuel is being funneled to the intake manifold for consumption by the engine. Now, it was determined long ago that the ideal air-fuel ratio for complete burning of fuel and air, maximum engine performance, and minimal engine emissions is approximately 14.7 units of air to one unit of fuel. And that fact, along with many others, is already programmed into the ECM, the car's onboard computer, and is used in the ECM's calculations for determining commands to the fuel system. Thankfully, one of the advantages of computers is that we don't have to know what they know. We just have to know that they work. As technicians and mechanics, the things we want and have to know about any component are pretty much standard. Uh, we want to know, one, how the unit works, two, how it works within the system, three, how to detect when and why it doesn't work, and four, when it doesn't work, how to remove and replace it. First, then, in our usual orderly fashion, we're going to look at how the oxygen sensor unit itself works. Now, while you and I both know that if the sensor is found to be defective, we're going to replace the whole unit and not some internal component, it's still important to our own task to understand the basic principles of what the O2 sensor does and how it does it. So let's begin that understanding by looking inside a typical O2 sensor. The sensor we're using for the sake of our illustration is the Zirconia type O2 sensor developed by AC Spark Plug Division in conjunction with General Motors Research Laboratories. The sensor element resembles a thimble and is made of zirconia. The outside of the zirconia is plated with a platinum coating, while a strip of the same platinum coating runs down the inside of the zirconia layer. The sensor is further designed so that air from the outside atmosphere flows past the inside platinum strip and gases from the exhaust manifold flow past the outside platinum plating. We'll call these two sites alternately the air reference side and the exhaust reference side of the sensor. Now, one of the important properties of zirconia is that when it comes into contact with oxygen ions, it becomes capable of conducting an electrical current. 
And where does the oxygen come into the picture? Well, when, and only when, the O2 sensor reaches a temperature of at least 600 degrees Fahrenheit, a chemical reaction takes place on the two platinum-coated surfaces on either side of the zirconia layer. Negatively charged oxygen ions from the outside atmosphere build up on the air reference side of the sensor, and fewer oxygen ions from the exhaust gases build up on the exhaust reference side of the sensor. Both platinum surfaces will take on a negative charge because the oxygen ions are negative ions but because the outside air obviously contains more oxygen than exhaust gases do, the negative charge on the air reference side of the sensor will be greater than the negative charge on the exhaust reference side. It's the difference in the strength of the negative charges on these opposing platinum layers that causes an electrical current to flow from the higher charge inside platinum strip through the zirconia conductor and onto the lower charge outside platinum plating. And it's that difference in the two electrical charges that will generate a readable voltage with the O2 sensor. And that's it. The sensor has completed its sole task. Its job is to establish an internal electrical voltage that indicates the difference between the oxygen content of the outside air and the oxygen content of the engine exhaust. But now that the sensor voltage is established, it's up to the ECM to read the oxygen sensor signal, interpret the data the signal contains, and then to provide appropriate commands to the fuel system. But before we leave the fascinating topic of the internal operations of the zirconia oxygen sensor, let's just review the basic principles by observing what happens within the sensor during the only two conditions it really has any interest or purpose in detecting exhaust gases too rich, and exhaust gases too lean. Going back to our graphic then, we'll follow the action inside the O2 sensor during an exhaust gases too rich condition. As the graphic illustrates, when the air-fuel mixture flowing past the exhaust reference side of the sensor is rich, that is, low in oxygen content, the number of oxygen ions that collect on the exhaust reference plate decreases. The difference between the charges on the two platinum surfaces therefore becomes larger, and so does the voltage between the two plates. When the exhaust gases are very rich, the sensor voltage can range upward to over 900 millivolts. However, when the air-fuel mixture flowing past the exhaust reference side of the sensor is lean, that is, high in oxygen content, the number of oxygen ions that collect on the exhaust reference platinum layer increases. The difference between the charges on the two platinum layers now becomes smaller, and so does the voltage between the two plates. When the exhaust gases are very lean, the sensor voltage can range below 100 millivolts. In summary, when the O2 sensor detects that the exhaust gases in the exhaust manifold are lean, it issues a low voltage. And conversely, when it detects that the exhaust gases in the exhaust manifold are rich, it issues a high voltage. Remember, however, that the O2 sensor is just that, a sensor. Its entire function is to monitor the oxygen content of the exhaust gases by converting the presence or absence of that oxygen into a readable voltage signal. The task of collecting, interpreting, and acting on the data that the O2 sensor voltage signal issues is the job of the brains of the operation, the ECM. And so, moving right along, we're going to link up with those brains of the operation. And that link up will lead us right into the second part of our discussion, how the O2 sensor works in the system. Now, let's define the system. What are we talking about here? It's the engine control system. It includes a network of engine sensors, the ECM, and output devices, fuel control and ignition components. Now, the O2 sensor and all wires and connectors linking it to the ECM is sort of a system within a system, the O2 sensor circuit. In order for the O2 sensor circuit to work at all, the system has to be in closed loop mode. Now, what puts the system in a closed-loop mode? Three things. 
One, the coolant temperature has to be above a specified value. Two, the oxygen sensor has to have reached its operating temperature of at least 600 degrees Fahrenheit, or 316 degrees Celsius. And three, the engine has to have been running for a minimum length of time, usually at least two minutes. If those three criteria haven't been met, you don't have an operating O2 circuit. What you do have instead is a system in open loop mode. Now in open loop, the ECM simply assumes that the O2 sensor hasn't yet reached its operating temperature and ignores it completely. With no O2 sensor feedback, the ECM calculates the air fuel ratio and commands the fuel system on the basis of input from the coolant temperature sensor and the engine load. As we mentioned a moment ago, the ECM has a three-sided task with regard to the O2 sensor. The first task is to collect the information detected by the O2 sensor. Now, the ECM does that by reading the O2 sensor voltage every 12.5 milliseconds. Now, that's an impressive 80 times a second. The second task is to interpret that information by comparing the sensor voltage reading with the ECM's own 450 millivolt internal reference signal. Why a 450 millivolt reference signal? because the ECM is only interested in detecting levels of oxygen in the exhaust manifold that would require it to take some corrective action. When the ECM reads a sensor signal of over 450 millivolts, it tells the fuel system to decrease the amount of fuel being delivered to the intake manifold. And, on the other hand, when the ECM reads a sensor signal of under 450 millivolts, it tells the fuel system to increase the amount of fuel being delivered. Now, let's go back and wrap up the whole process by following what happens from one end of the circuit to the other during an exhaust gases too rich condition. During this oxygen starved condition, the difference between the large number of oxygen ions on the air reference side of the sensor and the far fewer charged ions on the exhaust reference side of the sensor creates a high voltage signal between the two plates, a voltage of over 450 millivolts. We'll give this example signal a value of, say, 750 millivolts. Step one, we have a typical exhaust gases too rich sensor signal. Step two, the ECM reads a plus 300 millivolt variation on its 450 millivolt reference signal. Step three, the ECM then converts that reading into a command to the fuel system to reduce the amount of fuel being delivered to the intake manifold. The same process, with the opposite outcome, takes place during an exhaust gases too lean condition. Step one, the reduced difference in the number of oxygen ions on the opposing reference plates results in a low O2 sensor voltage. We'll use 100 millivolts. Step two, the ECM now reads a minus 350 millivolt variation on its 450 millivolt reference signal. Step three, the ECM converts that low voltage reading into a command to the fuel system to increase the amount of fuel being delivered to the intake manifold. And that, my friends, is the whole process and function of the O2 sensor circuit. But it's not only the technology involved, it's the speed with which the monitoring and signal process is repeated over and over again that's really quite amazing. Every 12.5 milliseconds is 4,800 times a minute. As long as, remember, the O2 sensor is above 600 degrees Fahrenheit and the system in closed loop operation. But it has to be fast. It has to be very fast. During normal engine operation, that O2 sensor voltage may cross the rich and lean threshold limits several hundred times a minute. And the ECM will also be called upon to make some fast commands to the fuel injectors. Again, several hundred times a minute. If it doesn't, what you have is an engine with a breathing problem. Now, as we mentioned at the outset, too much or too little oxygen can have detrimental effects on any engine. Now, we've explored how the O2 sensor works, how it works internally, and how it works within the system that we defined as the O2 sensor circuit. 
but in both cases, the assumption has been that it works. And that, my friends, brings us to diagnostics. How to find out when and why the thing doesn't work. Ah, but there's a science to that process. Or, I should say, there's a process to that science. And it sure helps everyone concerned if it's an orderly process. And the first order of business in proceeding with any diagnostic routine is to follow that old reliable rule of thumb. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So let's first make sure that the indication that the O2 sensor circuit is malfunctioning in some way is at least legitimate. Now, unless it has come to you or the customer in a vision, that first indication of a problem generally comes in the form of a service engine soon light, which in turn signals a trouble code. So, let's take a moment or two to look at reading and verifying trouble codes. Now, we might call this procedure pre-diagnostics, in that the first thing we want to know is if the ECM's diagnostics are even working before we believe their display. Now, we can check the diagnostics, or perform the diagnostic check, as it's commonly called, in one of two ways, with a scan tool or without a scan tool. And the scan tool route is definitely the better way to go. Now, there are a lot of scan tools on the market, but for our demonstration, we're going to use the new Tech One scanner. However, whichever scanner you use, make sure you read the manufacturer's instruction manual supplied with the scanner. And don't forget the car manufacturer's service manual for the vehicle you're working on, which contains a listing of the trouble codes the scanner displays. Our first diagnostic check, then, with the scan tool, will plug the scanner into the ALDL connector, the assembly line diagnostic link, and will plug the scanner's power cord into the cigarette lighter outlet. With the ignition on and the engine stopped, the ECM grounds the battery voltage through the service engine soon light, turning it on. With the scanner, the trouble codes will be displayed directly on the scan tool readout. And as we mentioned, that's definitely the better of the two methods. Without the scan tool, you'll have to insert a jumper between ALDL pins A and B to start the diagnostic circuit check. If the ECM's diagnostics are working, the engine light will flash once, pause, flash twice, and then repeat that pattern two more times. That's the code 12 we're looking for to tell us that the diagnostic functions in the ECM are working fine. So far, so good. Without the scanner, any trouble codes stored in the ECM's memory will begin flashing in sequence after the code 12. But again, we're going to go with the better route. We're going to use the scanner. And, lo and behold, we do have a trouble code. But whether it's obtained through the flashing of the engine light or by reading the display of the scan tool, the code 13 that we're getting is an indication that we may, and the emphasis is still on may, have a problem with the O2 sensor circuit. Just to be sure, we're not going to be jumping through hoops for nothing. Let's just try one more check. There's still the possibility that the trouble code could have been set accidentally. So, we'll jot down the code, or codes, we've deciphered from the flashing engine light, or read off the scan display. We'll turn the ignition off, and then we'll clear the ECM's memory. Now, we can do that in one of two ways. By removing the ECM's fuse, or fusible power link, located here near the battery, for about 10 seconds, or by disconnecting the battery for about 10 seconds. Okay, now we'll replace the fuse or reconnect the battery. We'll start the engine and allow it to run for a couple of minutes or until the service engine soon light comes back on. And it does. So, we'll shut off the engine and repeat the procedure for reading trouble codes. If the code we obtained earlier was legitimate, then the same code will also be detected after clearing the ECM's memory. Now, through the magic of video technology, we've speeded up that repeat procedure, and we still have a code 13. So, it would appear that we do have a legitimate problem in the O2 sensor circuit. Remember, though, that the circuit is the O2 sensor, all wires and connectors linking it to the ECM, and the ECM itself. 
A code 13 could indicate an open or shorted sensor circuit, a defective O2 sensor, a malfunctioning ECM, or a problem in that notoriously elusive area called other. And we're not even going to attempt to cover other today. But the codes do attempt to narrow the circuit problem down considerably. Code 13 is intended to signal an open O2 sensor circuit, and that's the code we're going to deal with here in a moment. But let me very quickly just touch upon two related scan codes. A code 44 indicates a lean exhaust when the ECM reads a low O2 circuit voltage for a specified length of time. Now, there are several possible causes for this, including a cracked or leaking manifold, a defective PCV hose, MAP sensor, EGR valve, fuel injector, or a short in the O2 sensor circuit itself. A code 45 indicates a rich exhaust when the ECM reads a high O2 circuit voltage for a specified length of time. Possible causes unrelated to the sensor circuit might include a defective EGR valve, fuel injectors, MAP or MAF sensor, high fuel pressure, restricted air cleaner, or a continuously purging vapor canister. Now for diagnosing any code, step one is to go to the service manual for the vehicle you're working on. Turn to the drivability and emissions section, section 6E for most GM vehicles. Find the diagnostic charts for the code you're investigating, code 13 in our case, and then, as we're going to do, Follow the procedures outlined on the charts in a step-by-step -step manner. And I do mean that literally. Now, these charts are designed with no shortcuts in mind. Step one from the diagnostic chart for code 13 is to determine if the system is, in fact, in closed loop. Remember the preconditions we discussed earlier for the O2 sensor circuit being a closed electrical circuit or going closed loop. The engine first has to be at normal operating temperature. So we run the engine for at least two minutes at over 1,200 RPM. That should give the O2 sensor sufficient time to warm to its minimum operating temperature of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. We know from our earlier discussion that the sensor will produce no voltage signal across the platinum-coated plates unless that temperature has been reached. When the engine warming requirements have been met, the ECM should start receiving voltage signals from the O2 sensor to convert to rich or lean commands to the fuel system. Remember that the sensor voltage is monitored every 12.5 milliseconds. That's 4,800 separate signals in one minute. In that one minute, the O2 sensor voltage signal should cross the upper and lower limits of its normal operating range, 350 to 550 millivolts, several times. If the ECM has not received confirmation that that has occurred within one minute, it will also signal a code 13. Now, even though the engine and O2 sensor have been warmed sufficiently, as you can see, the scan tool shows that we still have an open loop circuit. So our next step will have to be to determine if it's the circuit wiring or ECM at fault, or if it's the sensor itself causing the code 13. Step two from the chart instructs us to disconnect the wiring harness from the O2 sensor and use a jumper to ground the signal wire connecting the O2 sensor to the ECM, circuit 412. Grounding the circuit from the ECM will simulate a very lean exhaust condition and result in a low voltage reading. We'll check the scanner to verify the voltage signal. The scanner should display an O2 voltage below 200 millivolts with the engine running. Does it? Yes the scanner is reading below 200 millivolts. So the ECM and circuits are okay. Now, we've narrowed the problem down to the O2 sensor or the sensor connector. So we'll check the connection first to make sure that the contacts are clean and that the connector is properly mated. Well, the connector looks okay, so the root of the problem appears to be a faulty O2 sensor, which we'll have to remove and replace shortly. But we're going to leave that for a few minutes. Now, here's a revelation for you. Diagnostics are not always that easy. Suppose, going back a step, 
that we had a reading of above 200 millivolts on the scanner instead of below. But with a reading of over 200 millivolts, we can now rule out the possibility of a faulty O2 sensor or sensor connection. The remaining possibilities for the source of the problem are open circuits, faulty connections, or a defective ECM. So we'll go on to step three on the code 13 chart and eliminate the possible culprits one by one. To perform the test involved in this procedure, we'll need a 10 mag ohm high impedance digital volt ohm meter, a DVOM. We can't use a needle type or iron vein volt meter. The low input resistance would damage the sensor or ECM. We're going to check the continuity of the two relevant circuit connections, circuit 412, the signal wire from the ECM to the O2 sensor, and circuit 413 the O2 sensor ground wire from the ECM to the engine. The assumption we're making is that if the circuits are not the problem, and we already know that the O2 sensor is not the problem, then by the process of elimination, the ECM is the likely villain. First, we'll check circuit 412. With the ignition on and the engine off, we'll disconnect the sensor's connector unit and we'll then insert a digital volt ohmmeter between the connector unit and the engine ground. Now, we'll switch our meter to the two volt scale. If the meter reads between 300 to 600 millivolts, we can confirm that the O2 sensor is okay and that the problem is very likely a faulty ECM. However, if the voltage reading is over 600 millivolts, well, then that's our indication that the problem is an open or bad connection in circuit 413 or still possibly a defective ECM. But if the voltage reading was under 300 millivolts, that's our indication that we have an open or bad connection in circuit 412 or again, a faulty ECM. Now, obviously, we're going to inspect those circuits for damaged wires or loose grounds and the connections for dirt and other contaminations. But when we've narrowed the problem down to this point, our final procedure will be to confirm whether the ECM is good or not. To do that, we're going to back probe the connector to the ECM, again using the same meter. How do we do it? Simple. We'll go right to the source. We remove the meter leads and leave the O2 sensor disconnected. Then we'll go to the ECM and connect the positive meter lead to the circuit 412 terminal and the negative lead to the circuit 413 terminal. The reading should be between 0.3 and 0.6 volts. If it's not, then we've found our problem, the ECM, and that will have to be replaced. But that's also another video. Back to our own unfinished business. We left an O2 sensor back there a few minutes ago that has to be replaced yet. But we've certainly learned that there is a range of other related problems that can prompt a circuit failure. In fact, in over 50% of the instances where the sensor has been replaced, it was later found not to have been the culprit at all. But on to point four then. When we know it doesn't work, how to remove and replace it? Tools? We'll need a torque wrench with the proper size open end wrench adapter. But if you're going to remove an O2 sensor, remember that the threads of the new AC oxygen sensors are coated with a special AC anti-seize compound. If the sensor is removed for inspection, the special AC anti-seize compound will have to be reapplied to the sensor threads before that same sensor is reinstalled. The compound is made of glass beads and liquid graphite. While the graphite burns off during engine operation, the glass beads remain on the threads and enable the sensor to be removed for inspection or replacement. And we're going to do all three procedures. We're going to remove the sensor, inspect it for possible clues to the cause of its failure, and then we're going to replace it. First, we'll disconnect the O2 sensor connector from the ECM wiring harness connector by lifting the locking latch here on the sensor tail. And we're being careful not to break the latch. Then, we'll use the torque wrench to remove the sensor. If it's too tight, don't force it. Running the engine again for a few minutes to rewarm the exhaust manifold should solve that problem. Now that we've removed the sensor, 
Our next task is to inspect it visually for clues to what caused the problem in the first place and may cause the same failure again if it isn't detected. Here are some tips on how to detect some of the most common causes for sensor failure. Look at the black carbon or soot deposits on this sensor. Now this condition results from over-rich fuel mixtures and the cause of the rich mixtures should be investigated. But carbon by itself won't harm a sensor enough that it has to be replaced. It can be burned off by running the engine lean for two minutes. Now, here's one that will definitely have to be replaced. It has a whitish appearance and you can feel the fine chalky texture. Well, that's a good indication of silica contamination. Silica contamination from RTV gasket materials or from silicon in the fuel can eventually cover the surface of the sensor with a fine chalky residue resulting in lazy oxygen response and poor engine performance. Well, here's another sensor with a whitish appearance but with a sandy texture. The gritty white coating is caused by the deposit of additives from ethylene glycol or antifreeze entering the exhaust system. And this sensor also will have to be discarded. Now, if the sensor has a dark brown appearance like this one, the usual culprit is high oil consumption. Oil deposits will ultimately impede sensor operations, so we'll have to toss this one too. Now, there's another major source of sensor contamination, but one that's difficult to detect by visual inspection, and that's lead deposits. High concentrations of lead in the exhaust will glaze the sensor and inhibit its operation. Now, the obvious source of that contaminant is leaded fuel, and again, the sensor should be discarded. Examining the removed O2 sensor is not just an exercise in curiosity, but a necessary step in nailing down the real source of the problem. And the real source of the problem, as we've seen, may not be the O2 sensor or any part of the sensor circuit. Now that we've removed and inspected the old sensor, we're going to install the new one. The threads on the new sensors are already coated with anti-seize compounds, so we don't have to worry about that. But we do have to be careful when handling the sensor, wire, connector, and boot, or shield. If the unit is dropped, the zirconia element inside the sensor can crack. If it's dropped, shake the sensor to see if it's still good. If you hear a rattle, then use a new sensor. Now we'll insert the sensor into the exhaust manifold outlet and finger tighten it. Then we'll use a torque wrench and torque it to 30 foot pounds or 40.7 Newton meters. The torque setting is very important. If the O2 sensor is installed too loose, air can leak into the exhaust manifold and cause the sensor to be lean at idle. If it's installed too tight, the threads in the exhaust manifolds can be stripped when the sensor is removed again. So the torque is right on target, 30 foot-pounds. Finally, we'll join the oxygen sensor connector to the ECM wiring harness connector, and voila, we're done. Well, now, not quite. There's the final test. We have to clear the ECM's memory and then hope that no code resets. Gosh, we're good. Look at that, not a thing. Engines breathing fine. And it's because of the development of and continual improvement of components like the O2 sensor that we've been able to achieve remarkable results in the reduction of harmful engine emissions while maintaining good fuel economy and solid engine performance. And that, my friends, enables all of us to breathe a little easier.